it's Michelle Caruana from Play Cafe Academy and today I really want to talk to you guys about what reopening an indoor playground might look like or if you're just getting started what it might look like when you actually put your plan into motion. Now there's still a lot of uncertainty out there so we don't have a concrete plan just yet but I have been brainstorming a lot with the people in my Playmaker Society group. There's I believe 135 of us now and we've been collaborating together and of course every location is going to look a little bit different depending on politics depending on how badly hit your particular area was everything is still kind of in flux we have not come to any final decision decisions yet but i wanted to walk through some of the main points that we are going to consider when we do finalize our reopening plan and we're all kind of again collaborating on this so a lot of us are going to be using a very similar opening plan and that is one of the best things about having a group of 135 other indoor playground owners because we really put our heads together and I'm so, so thankful for them. And I'm so inspired by them because they are just continuing to push through and continuing to grow and build their businesses even in the wake of this COVID-19 crisis. So I wanted to share some of the things that we've put together, some of the ideas that we're running with, and a little bit about how exactly we plan to execute it. But before I get started, I did just want to quickly remind you to like this video if you find the information helpful. It helps me so much. And if you don't want to miss a video, subscribe to my channel and turn on the notifications so that you get notified every single time I post a new video, which is usually weekly, sometimes even more than once a week. All right. So... To me, the three pillars of a reopening plan have to consider three important things. Number one, trust with your customer base. It really has to be thorough enough and it has to take into account what your customer needs and wants. And we'll talk a little bit about that towards the later part of the video, but I really wanna make sure that whatever reopening plan I encourage other indoor playgrounds to use and things like that, it really works to establish a trusting relationship with customers because that is absolutely more important now than it has ever been. The second pillar is compliance. So of course, we wanna make sure that we're being compliant with any local national laws, um, any acts put into place. And this is gonna be the hardest part because things are not only changing extremely rapidly, but if you cater to younger children, it's very hard to implement some of these policies. So for example, we are in New York, of course, and one of the policies that we are living through right now is that if you are in public and you cannot safely social distance, meaning you can't physically be six feet apart from someone. So um, examples would be, you know, if you have to go to the doctor's office, if you have to go to the grocery store um, and you know you're going to be, there's going to be a chance that you're within six feet of people, you have to wear a mask. So of course, indoor playgrounds aren't open yet and we really have no way of knowing how long this mask mandate is going to last. But I've already tried to put a mask on my three-year-old and five-year-old and it was, not only was it very uncomfortable for them, but it completely changed their mood. They were constantly taking it off. They were pulling on it. It was very distracting to them. So I'm very hopeful that the mask mandate isn't going to last longer than it takes to reopen facilities like ours, but we do have to consider the reality that we might have to require masks for customers for a limited amount of time. And again, that's one of the reasons why I haven't put together a concrete in writing opening plan yet, because we just don't know what the laws are going to be, what the exact phases the country is going to reopen in. And again, every state is going to be different. New York's going to look a lot different than, you know, Georgia's already starting to reopen. I know California has their very specific plan. Their lockdown has already been extended in many areas through May 31st. So we're all going to be working on a different timeline. But again, compliance is going to be key and it's going to have to be something that we as business owners are going to have to be pay very close attention to for months, maybe even years to come. So make sure that whatever policy you put into place, make sure you call out that you are going to comply with any local laws. You may even be a little bit more stricter than those laws. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but make sure that your customers know that you are working in compliance with uh with the national and local laws because that's going to be one way for them to trust you, which builds into that first pillar. And of course, the third pillar is going to be safety. 
So we want to make sure, and this again goes into trust and compliance, but we want to make sure that our customers feel safe and they know that their safety and our staff's safety is, and of course our own family safety is number one top priority. Yes, of course we are a business and we need to make revenue in order to survive. However, safety is going to be of the utmost importance, especially for the next several months to again, maybe even a couple years. And we're gonna talk about exactly some of the safety measures that we're going to implement. But to me, when I am crafting this reopening plan and I did publish a blog about exactly what we're considering when we reopen. So if you'd rather read that, I did link it in the description. But again, it's not our concrete opening plan, but I am definitely considering how to get customers to trust me, how to make sure I'm compliant with all mandates, and how can I make sure that not only is the safety top of mind, but that customers know that safety is absolute top of mind. So we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into these, but just some high level bullet points that we're gonna cover is we're going to, of course, have to implement a capacity limit. So we're not going to be able to rely on getting as many people in the door as possible. We're gonna have to pivot. We're gonna have to be really smart. We're going to have to be a little bit creative as business owners, especially brick and mortar business owners. And we're just gonna have to you know, pivot. And again, like I said, get creative. So we're gonna talk about exactly how we're going to do that in a few minutes. So one of the things is going to be private or limited play dates, which again, we'll dig into scheduled classes, anything ticketed that has a cap at registration, and then also drop off care and summer camps. And we always do drop off care in the summer. Typically, like for example, what we did last year was we um, closed Monday and Wednesday afternoon. So we closed at 1.30 and then from 2 to 5 p.m. we did only drop off summer care. And that was kind of our business model. Now, because of everything that's happening and because it looks like based on the different phases in New York, it looks like we may not be able to reopen until June, July, August. And again, we are relocating one of our locations. So we're kind of in limbo there. Everything's kind of on hold, but we do have the other license location. And again, I do work with all of the other indoor playground owners in Playmaker Society, which I link to below. But anyways, so we're actually considering for this summer doing only drop off summer camps because, you know, for a couple reasons. Number one, it's going to be a very small capacity limit. So there are going to be, instead of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of children in and out of the door every single day um, or every single week, rather, depending on the size of your facility, it's going to be the same group of children. So whether it be 10 children, 12 children, 20 children, again, depending on the size of your facility and how many staff members you're able to have on board for this, it's going to be the same kids every single day. So we're going to do a morning five-day session, Monday through Friday, three hours, so nine to 12. And then we're going to do an afternoon five-day session, one to four. So say we have 20 children for the morning session, 20 children for the afternoon session. Those are the only 40 people that are going to be in and out of the facility every single day. We actually have a vestibule in both facilities, and that's what we're going to be doing the drop off and pick up and things like that. We are going to be doing some recording so that parents can get more of a hands on feel and things like that. We're still working through the legal side of it. It's not like we're going to be live streaming it or anything. It's going to be only provided to the parents that actually sign up, but that's something that we're working through that we're considering. And that would be from June um, as, long, as soon as we're able to reopen and then through the end of August. And again, we're not even sure if schools are going to be reopening in September. So a lot of this might change, but we are considering doing only summer drop-offs for the entire summer because we've been doing a lot of surveys to our customer base. And I know a lot of the members inside Playmaker Society are also putting out surveys and asking customers, uh, you know, how comfortable they feel coming back for open play. And while it does seem extremely optimistic, everyone is very excited to come back and visit us. Um, people do definitely seem like they are eager to get back into the facility. However, they do have some concerns, again, about capacity, about social distancing and things like that. So we have gotten the feedback that for the time being, they would feel much more comfortable if it was a closed, limited group of children. And when there's less children in a facility as well, of course, it's a little bit easier to maintain distance. So for example, where we would normally have one table and have everybody eat their snack or do their arts and crafts activity or something like that. Now we're going to space it out a little bit more. Of course, they're children, it's not going to be perfect. 
And again, we are going to comply with all mandates. So if we are required to social distance, then we may not be able to reopen as planned in the summer. However, assuming that we are, we are going to be as conscious as possible with these children to maintain social distancing. And another thing that we're considering is only taking a little bit older children. So instead of doing the typical two year to five year range, we might consider doing five to nine or something like that because not only are those children and those families a little bit more concerned with getting them caught up scholastically, so getting them ready for the new school year, making sure they're sharp with all their skills, making sure they still know how to use their manners, making sure they still know how to interact with other adults, interact with other children. So I think that age group is gonna be more in need this summer of that structured camp style. And it's also a lot easier for that age range to maintain social distancing. So it's a lot easier to explain to a five to nine year old, you know, what it means to social distance. They might recognize any visual cues. So if we put X's on the floor or something like that, they're gonna be able to comprehend that and maintain that a little bit better. It's still gonna be a little bit more complicated especially on that younger end, those five-year-olds, you know, I have a five-year-old, I am already dreading all of the social distancing um, stuff when things do start to reopen, but I do think that we are gonna move towards that age range at least for the summer. And if schools don't reopen, then we might consider maintaining that through the fall. Now, one of the most common questions I get is whether or not uh, you actually need a, a, a different childcare license or something like that to do this sort of drop-off care? And the answer is definitely going to depend on your state. So in New York, we are, first of all, I would definitely contact a lawyer. I am not a lawyer and cannot give legal advice. So definitely do that. Definitely create your own drop-off waiver and things like that. But in New York State, we are able to provide a limited amount of childcare. So at the time being, it's five hours of care or less per day, uh, per child to in order to not need to apply for a daycare license now i do think that more facilities are going to start offering drop-off care and if you watched my last video you probably saw that i'm definitely going to be advocating for more regulations around this type of thing around type of cleaning and things like that because as play spaces we're really not regulated whatsoever in terms of cleaning unless we have a kitchen or something like that and even then it's only the kitchen that's regulated so I don't mean to get off topic, but we are able to do this sort of drop-off care without having a daycare childcare license because that can be very cost prohibitive. So make sure that you are looking up your local laws. Again, compliance is one of the main themes of this video. So just make sure you're doing your part to make sure that you are able to do that and able to be compliant and safe and all that good stuff. Now, another thing that we are considering, and now I'm gonna be talking more long-term, so after this immediate spring, summer, potentially fall time period, is how are we going to make sure that we are prepared in order to be safe for you know months, maybe years to come? So the first thing that we're going to be doing is we're gonna be moving towards a much more membership-based model, and this is for a couple different reasons. So first of all, a membership model has so much potential for really stable recurring revenue. So when somebody signs up, we typically have them sign up for a year long contract, but they're able to pay monthly. We are considering moving this to monthly or having some sort of buyout clause or something like that. But the bottom line is we want to be able to at least rely somewhat on that membership income. So that's number one. As a business, I would love to be able to rely on that. And not for nothing, if you have a membership model, those people that are investing more long-term in your business, so what I mean by that is they're signing a contract for maybe it's a month, maybe it's a year, but it's more commi commitment than just like a regular day pass. So they're gonna be more committed, they're going to be more invested in your success, and they're going to be, they're going to establish a much greater bond and a much greater trust relationship with your business. So when we do reopen, we're going to be able to rely on our members to really, you know, be the first ones to visit our facility, be our champions in the community and things like that. So we really work with our current members in order to make sure that we're fulfilling their needs. We survey them all the time. We have members only events. We give really great bundles in terms of memberships, which I'll talk more about in a second. 
but we are even though we've always had memberships we're moving towards an almost membership only model again because we want to have that trusting relationship with our customers and we want to be able to rely on that revenue because if we ever do need to close again if there's a second wave or if anything like this happens in the future we want to make sure that we feel comfortable asking people of course not requiring people but we would in the future ask members if they would consider keeping their membership active for maybe just a month or two or maybe just using their membership as a credit to their account and not canceling it or something like that so gyms uh schools those type of like private schools those type of like membership models they are probably doing okay right now as long as they asked even a portion of their members to remain active during this COVID-19 crisis. Now, again, of course, we're making different decisions every single day, depending on timelines and what's happening, but that is something that I'm definitely considering because again, they're invested in your success. They wanna see you reopen and they wanna see you reopen with the same familiar faces that they left with. So they don't want you to have to furlough your entire staff. They don't wanna have to, they don't want you to have to completely redo your facility or close your facility. I have found, and I've been so pleasantly surprised that so many people were willing to keep their membership active just so that we could pay employees, just so that we could remain open. So that is something that we're definitely considering for the future. And then of course the obvious, a membership only model means less people in and out, and it's going to be generally the same crowd. So instead of having to rely on selling, you know, 25 to 50 day passes, and those people might be in and out of other play facilities. Um, it might be always a different 50 people every single day. So, you know, I'm not going to break out my calculator, but instead of having a different crowd of 50 families in our facility every single day, we would much rather have the same like 100 to 150 families in and out every single day because they're going to start trusting each other. They're going to start viewing each other as family. And again, it's just going to be a lot less risky for us as a facility to have that same group of people in and out all the time. So we're of course thinking about our business revenue, but we're also thinking about safety and making sure that our customers are comfortable coming to us eventually for open play once we're able to offer that. So I'm actually gonna be coming out with a brand new course on how to book more memberships. And I'm going to offer it for free to people already in Play Cafe Academy, but it's already in the works. I'm almost done with the beginning stages. So just stay tuned for that because I do think that membership models are the future for any business, especially any brick and mortar business that previously relied on getting new foot traffic in every single day. I definitely think consumer preferences are changing in that regard. So I am here to help. I am here to support. And I am so excited to share my knowledge with all of you. All right. Moving on, we're also going to rely more on online offerings. So this is going to manifest in a couple different ways. So I have helped many of the owners inside Playmaker Society start their own uh, e-commerce stores. Now, we always offered e-commerce on our website. However, we were using Squarespace. And while I do think Squarespace has a great uh, e-commerce platform, if you're doing you know, just a couple products or if you're doing low volume or you know, if you don't need a lot of bells and whistles. However, we have been really advocating for Shopify sites. So there is the regular Shopify site and then there is Shopify Lite. So depending on your website platform, you might be able to use the Lite version, that's very inexpensive, or you might be able to use the full version of Shopify, but we have really been beefing up our retail sales. So craft kits, sensory bins, toys, um, anything like that, we're definitely putting more of an emphasis on because online sales, I think the last time I checked, this was mid April, online sales have gone up over 270% overall across industries. And that is a very big difference. And I don't really see that trend going away anytime soon. So I really think that customers are going to visit retail establishments less, they're going to be going to toy stores less. They might even be going to Target and Walmart less, especially when they're shopping for birthday parties. And of course there's Amazon, but we do wanna offer them the option to support a small local business. So we're of course working with our current retailers. So Melissa and Doug is our main toy retailer, but we're also moving towards drop shipping. So 
Brandy from uh, the Little Red Barn Playground over in California. She was super helpful and she shared with me some of the companies that she's been using for drop shipping. So if you don't know, basically what drop shipping is, is you put the link to the toy on the website, you purchase it, but the customer purchase it, purchases it on your website. However, all of the fulfillment and all of the shipping and all of that stuff is handled by the company. So essentially, you're just responsible for getting that initial sale and then they're responsible for actually, you know, picking the item, shipping it and actually having it arrive at their door. So it's very little commitment from you. It saves you so much time. It saves you the burden of having to purchase an inventory. And something that I love about Melissa and Doug and some of those other companies is they have come up with ways to help uh, retail businesses like ours by deferring payment. So you can purchase an inventory and then not pay for it for up to 120 days. However, drop shipping just takes away the risk entirely because you do not have to keep an inventory. You don't have to worry about, you know, how many customers are going to be interested in this item versus another item. So I'm so thankful that Brandy shared those drop shipping tips with me because I have to admit, I did have a really bad taste in my mouth from some previous drop shipping experiences I have from more like overseas companies. However, a lot of these companies are US based. They are having to pivot themselves because they know that retailers are more wary than ever about buying a big inventory. They are more cash strapped than ever. So I love drop shipping as an option. And I'm probably going to be um, ending up doing a video on that one topic entirely because the game has changed so much in the drop shipping game. So I do want to share those tips with you, but that is something that we're going to be doing. And it's something that is so easy to implement if you don't want to have an inventory, if you don't want to have to have a staff constantly at the post office, um, if you're worried about not really knowing what's going to resonate with your customers, that is a great option. Another thing that we're going to be moving towards is more online classes and workshops. So yes, we're going to be offering some music classes online. We're going to be offering um, some other programs online, but something that I really love that I saw lately was another Playmaker Society member. Her name is Tiffany and she is the owner of My Play Cafe. So I will link to her business in the description, but she actually is offering like tummy time classes with a physical therapist. So the moms are actually, or the parents rather, are actually all able to call in they're able to see each other on Zoom and a, a physical therapist is actually showing them with, you know, either a doll or their own baby exercises that they should be doing to make sure their baby is developing normally and hitting all of their milestones. And I absolutely love that as a option because it not only provides really valuable knowledge to parents that need it in the community who maybe don't have access to a physical therapist otherwise because of these restrictions or because they're immune compromised or vulnerable or anything like that. They're able to get this information in the safety of their own homes. And I love that she's doing it on Zoom because all the babies can see each other, all of the moms can see each other or parents, and they're just able to have that little bit of social connection. Even though it's not ideal doing it through a computer, it's really all we have right now. So I absolutely love that she's doing that. And she's charging we're going to be charging for some of our programs some of our programs are going to be offered for free which i'll talk more about in a minute but we are going to be doing a mix of paid and free classes but we are definitely going to be moving more towards online offerings and we use kajabi for this so we previously used thinkific that was a an e-learning platform we're now going to be using kajabi and zoom and i'm so so excited for that I'm actually going to be doing, again, another video, the same way I did the video about why we switched to Aluvi from all of our other systems, which is our point of sale software. We're going to be talking about why we're switching to Kajabi, or rather why we have already switched, why it's a better e-learning platform for our specific needs, what the transition looked like, and everything like that, because it was definitely more complicated than I thought, but I am absolutely loving Kajabi. It's going great for all of our online classes and workshops. and I'm so excited to share all of those tips with you. All right, so another thing that we're going to be doing and that I'm recommending, you know, we already have a cafe in both of our facilities, but a recommendation that I'm updating inside my Play Cafe Academy course in light of the COVID-19 crisis is I'm definitely recommending that you incorporate a cafe. Even if it's a very basic coffee maker, even if it's a very basic espresso machine, even if you're purchasing baked goods from you know, other local retailers, I definitely think that 
being able to be included in that essential business category is going to be absolutely crucial for people moving forward because unfortunately what we've seen is that if you don't have an essential part of your business a lot of local governments are really not letting businesses operate at all so i've seen some play cafes that do not have any technically essential part of their business i've seen their local businesses actually put their foot down and say hey you cannot do any birthday balloon deliveries. You cannot do any play kit deliveries. You can't provide any any sensory bins. You can't do any e-commerce sales because no part of their business fell into that essential category prior to the COVID-19 crisis. So do I think that's fair? Do I think that's right? Absolutely not. I think as long as they're abiding by the state mandate and as long as they're being safe and protecting their employees and their customers, I think they should be able to pivot their business as they see fit in order to survive. However, we just haven't seen that be the case. And, you know, we haven't really been able to rely on local governments, national governments to provide any sort of clear guidance or any sort of serious help to small businesses in any, you know, grand scheme of things. So long story short, I'm not going to get political in this video, but I would make sure to make absolutely positive that your business could be considered essential, at least part of it, like the cafe, because you guys saw that I talked to Christine from Sweet, P Sweet Peas Play Cafe last week, and she mentioned that she is doing an amazing job with her coffee sales. She's been doing bundles with coffee and muffins, with coffee muffins and craft kits, with Mother's Day baskets, with balloons. She's been doing all sorts of stuff. However, if she didn't have that cafe aspect to deem her essential, she might not be able to do any of that. So it's kind of an all or nothing deal. So I would definitely make sure you incorporate some sort of food and drink uh, into your business so that you can be considered essential if this drags on longer than we think, or if there's a second wave, or if this ever happens again, because we wanna be building long-term sustainable businesses. So that is going to be very, very crucial. Another thing that we're going to make sure that we're doing is finding a way to do ticketed uh, play times. So we're going to be focusing on scheduled classes, scheduled events, but with the emphasis on the fact that you have to purchase tickets in advance. Now, we used to use Occasion for this. Again, you guys know that we now use Aluvi. So we're going to be really focusing on these ticketed events. Number one, because it guarantees revenue for us. We don't typically offer refunds with our events, of course, unless there's something major, like if there's a second wave or if the state closes our facility or something like that, but we typically don't offer refunds. So we're going to be able to at least project a couple weeks in the future what our revenue is going to look like because we're taking these payments in advance or at least taking deposits in advance. So previously we were really focusing on birthday parties and things like that, but now we're putting a lot more of an emphasis on events, uh, classes, small group play groups, because again, it's easier to maintain social distancing in that setting. And because we're moving towards a membership based model, we're going to, of course, try to focus on keeping our memberships filling these, um, those that have memberships filling these classes, events, and things like that. We haven't decided yet if we're going to include these classes in our membership price. Currently we do not, but if we move towards a fully membership uh, based facility. So we're not allowing any non-members in the facility unless it's for a birthday party. We might consider including these types of classes into our into our prices, but we haven't made that decision quite yet just because we're still, again, seeing how everything plays out, seeing how long the stay-at-home order lasts and things like that. But we are definitely putting way more of an emphasis on those things moving forward. And we're revamping our website. We're making sure that we have all of our ducks in a row when it comes to booking so that when we are able to start booking again, we are ready to hit the ground running. So we are using this time at home very wisely and we are doing a lot of work on prepping for this reopening. Now, the last thing that we're going to cover today is how we're going to be revamping our cleaning procedures. And I do think that this deserves an entire video in itself. So I'm going to go through the high level points because again, we haven't really seen any direction from the Center for Disease Control in quite a while. So I'm gonna be keeping my eye on their recommendations, but as of right now, this is what we're going to consider when we're revamping our cleaning procedures. And this is what I'm recommending to people in Playmaker Society, and they also contributed to this list. All right, so the first point is if you are 
current, if you currently let customers come in with shoes and strollers and things like that, things that touch the ground, consider going shoeless. So we are already a shoeless facility. However, we're considering having people take off their shoes before they even come in our cafe area and having stroller parking in the vestibule only because we've seen based on research that this virus lives on surfaces. So we wanna make sure that everything coming into our facility is as clean as possible. And is it going to completely eliminate risk? No. Is it going to reduce risk? Reduce risk? Yes. So we are going to continue being a shoe-free facility, but we are gonna have guests remove shoes before they come into the cafe. Now we do have to make special considerations for our employees. We're going to have them have uh, indoor only shoes. So they're gonna be able to leave their shoes at work so that they're never touching outside surfaces. And we're going to have them lace all them and potentially wear shoe covers and things like that. And speaking of shoe covers, you are going to have to have a plan in place if you are a shoeless facility. If somebody comes in in a wheelchair in shoes that they cannot remove for whatever reason, whether it be orthotics or any other disability, and you're going to have to have a plan for when people come in with crutches or braces or uh, you know, motorized scooters, anything like that. Because of course we wanna be um, welcoming to people of all abilities. So what we currently do and what we're going to continue doing is we wipe down wheelchair wheels before um, a guest enters the play area. Now we're going to do it before they enter the cafe. We do the same with braces and we offer shoe covers for those with shoes that cannot be removed. So please do not leave our friends with other abilities out. You have to make sure that you have a game plan for everybody and for every situation. So if a mom comes in with a stroller and you know the baby's sleeping or something like that, make sure that you are very transparent and your policies are available online so that she can make sure that she brings one of those um, carriers that comes out and things like that. And if she has to wipe the bottom of it, she has to wipe the bottom of it, but just make sure that you're being mindful of people, you know, again, of all abilities, but also in all stages of parenting. Cause I know parents of twins really rely on strollers. So if you're building out your facility, make sure you put stroller parking in the front uh, and room for shoes in the front. And then speaking of the check-in process, we're also going to have um, sinks at the, at the opening of all of our facilities. So before somebody is able to enter our facility and touch anything, we're going to make it a requirement that they have to wash their hands. So because we are already open, we can't really replumb our entire facility. However, there are freestanding sinks that are available on Amazon. You know, we are a pretty small volume facility, especially now that we're going to be more membership based. So we are going to feel okay with one sink. We might get more sinks, but we are going to have adults and children wash their hands immediately upon entering our facility before they touch anything. And we actually were moving towards touch screens with a Luby. However, we're now backing that up and we are not going to be using touch screens anymore because even if somebody is required to wash their hands, it's not a 100% foolproof me proof method. We really want to make our facility as safe as possible. Again, is this going to completely eliminate risk? No. Is it going to reduce risk? Yes. So that's the main question that I ask myself when I'm thinking about these policies. So we're not going to have any touch screens anymore. We're going to move towards um, an actual manual check-in process, which is going to cost us a little bit more, but it's going to keep our staff and our customers safe. We are also considering adding some sort of shield or some sort of, sort of height differential so that our uh, cashiers can check people in safely and our customers can feel safe. And again, of course, if we're required to wear masks, we will do so, but I'm really, really hoping that that doesn't become necessary. Um, and again, if masks are required, you might need to be required to sell masks or provide masks. So I'm not gonna make any decisions based on that yet because again, it's still so up in the air, but I would just have that in the back of your mind when you're thinking about re a reopening plan. Something else that we're going to do at least temporarily is temperature checks. So we got one of those automatic um, infrared thermometers and we're gonna have a couple in case one breaks and we are gonna be doing temperature checks at the door before anyone is uh, admitted to play. So if an adult or child has a fever over 100 degrees, which is considered a fever, they are not gonna be admitted to play. And to me, this is much safer, uh, much more safe than saying, if you have symptoms, stay home. Because again, it's black and white, it's on the thermometer um, and it's really irrefutable. So it's, less subjective it's and it, so people are going to be a little bit less emotional about it i think 
previously when we would hear someone coughing or see a runny nose and we asked them to leave, people would get very, very defensive. And I think seeing the number on the thermometer will really help with that. And just making sure that we do those temperature checks, it's going to help establish that, you know, that trust again with our customers. And yes, I know that not everybody who is a COVID-19 carrier has a fever, but again, it is, it does play a huge factor in reducing risk. And this is going to be for all classes, for all birthday parties, everything like that. Um, we are also going to be implementing more, more cleaning procedures, obviously. So we were already looking into an antimicrobial treatment such as MicroShield. I talked about them in a previous video, but basically what it is, is it's a fog that you put out through your entire facility. And not only does it disinfect germs that were previously on equipment, but it actually is proactive and prevents germs from forming, um, dangerous germs from forming on your equipment. Again, is it perfect? No, but is it better than anything that we had in place? Yes. So we're definitely going to be looking into more of that. Some facilities are actually putting in their own fog machines that they can use either daily or multiple times throughout the day in order to make sure that they are being as clean as possible. And we already had really strict cleaning procedures in place, but of course, we are keeping our thumb on the pulse of what is going on and we're making sure that we are being as stringent as absolutely as we possibly can. We are also going to consider closing multiple times throughout the day in order to clean. So this is going to be one of the hardest things to enforce, but because we are moving more towards a membership model, because we are doing more scheduled classes and events, we are considering having like a one hour period in the middle of the day where everybody has to go home or everybody at least has to go on the cafe side of our facility and eat lunch or do a craft or do some sort of workshop or class. And we're going to have our, our staff totally wipe down the play area, at least the high traffic areas. Now, we already had a practice where we would always have two sets of toys. So for example, our wooden bakery toys, we always have a clean set and then we always have a, a set that's on the floor. So we're not expecting us to kind of clean every single toy, but rather switch out the clean set for the dirty set. And then once we reopen, we're able to then clean that dirty set. So we're being a little bit more time efficient. And same with a lot of our dress up clothes and same with a lot of our smaller toys. We do have multiple sets of those so that we are able to quickly switch them out and make sure we always have a clean set. So that is something that we're considering. Again, we're still looking through the logistics of that, but definitely between birthday parties, we're gonna have more of a cushion between events, but we are still trying to figure out that time for closing during open play. Now we are also going to be a lot more transparent about our cleaning practices. And I think that all indoor playground owners and all brick and mortar business owners should really consider doing the same. We're gonna be having you know YouTube videos specific to our facility about exactly what we're doing. We're going to show them any treatments that we're doing. So if we do have an antimicrobial treatment done, we're gonna actually video as much as we can and show them, show them what the new check-in procedure is going to be like. Because a lot of, a lot of this uncertainty comes from fear. So people might not want to frequent your facility because they don't know what changes you've made. You know, even though you know internally and you've spent so much time on it, even if you've posted about it on Facebook, even if you've emailed it, they might not be able to connect and have that visual experience of what's going to be different. Um, you know, what do the sinks look like? Is it close enough to the front? What is the check-in process gonna be like? They might just be so overwhelmed with all of the changes that it's going to help them if you actually video somebody, you know, a mock, a mock customer interaction. So somebody walking in, washing their hands, getting their temperature checked, being checked in with a cashier with a divider potentially, um, you know, walking through, seeing all of the new hand sanitizing stations and things like that that we're adding. Um, you know, seeing if we are gonna implement social distancing with camps you know, showing them the visual cues on the floor because not only do we need to reassure the parents, but we also need to prep all of the little ones for all of these changes because the last thing we want is for us to sour their experience or to intimidate them or to scare them with all of these new practices. So we are going to be implementing some new videos that actually, again, walks people through the process so that both parents and children know what to expect and they feel a lot more comfortable and a lot more prepared before their first return visit. And we're also going to document it in writing and we're also going to have a lot of employee training seminars to make sure they know exactly what our practices are so that if somebody calls, if somebody emails, if somebody asks in person, they know exactly what to say 
And you know, there's absolutely no uncertainty because the last thing we want is to implement all of these great changes and to spend all this money on revamping a facility for somebody to call and an employee to say, well, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, I don't really know. So we are definitely going to be um, making that a, a huge point of employee training. And we're going to make sure that they know as well that we're going to be keeping them safe. So again, to wrap things up, the bottom line, the three things that we're really considering when we're putting together our reopening plan is making sure that it's one that our customers can trust and making sure that we are able to establish that trusting relationship with our customers, that we are making sure that we're being compliant with all state and national mandates, and that we are putting safety as a priority. Again, yes, we need revenue to survive, but with these pivots and with these new policies, I'm very confident that the indoor play industry will continue to thrive. It might look a little bit different for the coming months. Like for example, we might not always have a divider between our cashier and our guests. We might not always do temperature checks. I do think a lot of these trends um, or changes are gonna be permanent, but of course we're going to continue making um, making informed decisions every single day, week, month, and staying up to date. But I do feel very confident that the indoor play industry will continue to thrive. I put out a whole video on that a couple of weeks ago, so you can go back and watch that. But I'm very optimistic, and I hope that if you're watching this and you're considering starting up an indoor play space, even if you might feel like waiting right now, I do feel very confident that people are still going to want to socialize their children. They're still going to want to participate in classes and workshops. Parents are still going to want to connect with one another and they will still need a change of scenery around the house. So I, again, feel very optimistic and I hope this put your mind at ease a little and I hope it gave you some really practical ideas about how the industry is going to be changing and how my personal recommendations for other indoor playground um, indoor playground owners are going to change. I am completely updating a lot of the lessons inside my Play Cafe Academy course to reflect that. And I'm just so, again, thankful that I have 135 other indoor playground owners and prospective owners that I can collaborate with and that I can lean on for support. So if you're interested, click the link below this video and it will tell you all about my course and my group coaching program. And you can see if you are a good fit. And if you haven't subscribed yet, I would really appreciate you doing so. It helps so much more than you know. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment and I will personally answer it. Have a great day, guys.